Hello there. I'm Asher Leamond, and welcome to the Spoon Drift Podcast. Here on the show, I talk about a lot. I skim the surface of a giant ocean of information and capture the spoon drift. On today's episode, I'm going to be talking about grief. It's a topic especially relevant to me right now, and one that I know already is or will be relevant for everyone at some point. It's a difficult topic, but one that I think needs to be talked about. So just a heads up, the content of this episode is a bit heavy. Here we go. Today's episode will be one that may be a bit difficult, both for me and maybe for you as a listener. But today we're going to be talking about the stages of grief and their importance, what they are, and maybe a little bit of why we even talk about them in that context at all. At least for me, I think it helps to organize things. And when it comes to grief, grief is, it's a, it's a mess of feelings, uh, to put it bluntly. There's a lot, a lot of things usually going on. Either some major life altering event, maybe a loss of a loved one, a loss of a job, a loss of a significant other, um, just a major change in your life that it causes, well, first you to, there's something missing that you used to count on to always be there. And it, it requires a bit of shift in mindset, a bit of readjustment when it comes to evaluating your life. And there's a lot of thinking that one has to do in order to come to terms with that event, to realize that what happened in the past has happened, and there's nothing you can do to change that at this point. To, to realize that to move forward is really the only way to move on. And when it comes to sorting through that process and in, in, in understanding those feelings, I think it helps to be able to identify or at least discuss and have some words tied to the different stages associated with grief. And so the, that's what we're going to be talking about today. An article that we're going to be looking at comes from Healthline.com. And it was written by Kimberly Holland and then medically reviewed by Dr. Timothy J. Legg, a certified registered nurse practitioner. The specific model that we're going to be looking at is referred to as the Kubler-Ross model, and it's one that consists of five different stages. It was developed by Swiss-American psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross over the course of her entire life working with terminally ill people. And so through that experience working with people who were realizing that they were going to be dying very soon in the future, she developed this sort of framework in order to organize the stages of grief. And that organization was published in 1969 in a book, which was then referenced in future years and has come to allow a lot of people to better understand the stages of grief. So when it comes to organizing the stages of grief... Um, a couple warnings ahead of time. They, while they are a handy framework, all these different stages, they are not concrete or linear in any way. They may happen differently. People may experience these stages in different ways. They may experience them in different orders. Some of the steps may be skipped entirely. The thing to remember is that everyone experiences grief a little bit differently. Okay, so in uh, just brief overview, the five different stages that we're going to be talking about are number one, denial, number two, anger, number three, bargaining, number four, depression, and number five, acceptance. Number one, denial. This is when immediate, it's typically first, that's why it's stage one. It's when right after the loss happens, Instead of confronting that idea, it's easier to just pretend that the change hasn't happened. Now, as a defense mechanism, what it ends up doing is allowing you to more, allow you to like take a step back and more gradually absorb the information to more slowly realize that this loss has occurred instead of it just 
all of a sudden overwhelming you by denying that it's happened, it, it buys you some time. In the article, an example used to demonstrate denial in the case of a terminal illness might go as, this, this isn't happening to me. The results are wrong. Uh, check this again. Let's run this test again. It, it had to be a, there had to have been a mistake. Denial. That's when you just don't think that what's happening has happened, and it's there's got to be another explanation. Stage two, anger. This is it helps um, mask the emotions. And it helps hide them, hide all of the, the confusion, the pain that's happening. It hides them in anger. Now it may be directed at a number of different things, maybe at people, maybe the person that you lost, the person who died, the person who you were previously married to, the person who you were previously dating. Maybe it's someone completely unrelated. You've got all this stuff going on and someone's unhappy at you for not doing something and you snap and you just get real mad at them even though they didn't do anything wrong. Maybe it's an inanimate object. Maybe you get frustrated with your house because things keep breaking and you get mad at the house even though the house is totally unrelated to the the event that caused the problem but it, this is just kind of a way of an, an an intermediate step in the grieving process stage three is bargaining bargaining is when you look for other ways to gain control when you're looking for ways to eliminate uncertainty in your life. And it's characterized by a lot of what if or if only statements. Now in the article, some examples that they give is if only I'd spent more time with her, she would have stayed. Or if only I'd been more attentive to their needs, they might still be alive. If only I hadn't upset them so much. Or what if I'd worked on the weekends, would I still have a job? Um, in the case of religious people, it might involve someone asking God or their higher power that if they're if they do something like say if they're nicer to people, would the higher power grant them relief from all of the the, the pain, the confusion, the uncertainty? I, I imagine it kind of takes root in. Uh, a desire to understand why things happened. And so in doing this and looking for ways to bargain, you're kind of inadvertently looking for potential causes for what may have happened. You're, um, in this case, like when we were talking about the bargaining, if I'm nicer to people, will I, can I be relieved from some of these feelings? It might be you kind of thinking about how in the past, maybe your anger or frustration with people may have had something to contribute to the reason that this happened, even though it didn't. It I, This is just me speculating here, but the the bargaining is a, a, ways, a, a way for someone to, to uh, uh, at least hope to get relief from the mix of emotions that they're feeling. Stage four, depression. Now, instead of bargaining or looking for ways that you can do something in return for relief. This is, it's more passive in the sense that it's not you actively asking for something or seeking relief from something else. Uh, it may be characterized by loss of motivation, but what it actually is, is it's you becoming, it's you starting to work through your feelings in a healthier way by taking the time to see your feelings because it usually is intense sadness and loss. Uh, those aren't going to make you feel happy. And so the, they are going to make you feel sad. And that's what this depression stage is. You may feel foggy or heavy or confused. It, there's bleak outlook at this point. Um, and if, if you do feel stuck, if you're unable to move out of this stage, uh, the article reminds you 
the article reminds us, that talking to a grief counselor or a therapist or any mental health professional could really help at this point. But this depression stage is one very important in the grieving process. And stage five is called acceptance. Now this, this final stage, it's not necessarily a happy one. It doesn't mean that you've moved past the grief. It doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden lifted from this confusion. You now understand everything. It's not that you're no longer sad. It's only that you've accepted that what has happened has happened, and there's nothing that you can do to change that. You're now starting to understand what that means for the rest of your life. You may feel entirely different at this stage, and that's expected. It's simply the point in time when you realize that what's done is done, and it's now time to live with the fact that that change has happened. In the case of a terminally ill person, the article gives an example like, now I have the opportunity to tie things up and make sure that I get to do what I want to do in these final weeks and months. My death won't be unexpected. Maybe in the death of a loved one. I'm fortunate enough to have spent these wonderful years with the person and I will always have them in my memories. It's coming to terms with what's happened and deciding that you will live with that fact. So there's the five-stage system. It consisted of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. A little over a year ago, two figures in my life were diagnosed with terminal illnesses. And it happened in, in close succession. They were given a couple weeks, and that was difficult news, especially given the time frame in which it happened. And about a little over a year later, they both passed away in quick succession, which was difficult. Now, the great thing about it is that while they were given a couple a couple of weeks, quite frankly, they had much more time than that, more time than they were anticipating on both counts. And for that, I am very grateful. And because I think in this situation, because it's kind of weird, because there are the two figures, one of which was human and the other of which was not, both of them being diagnosed with the illnesses at about the same time, they, and all the time period after that, in my mind, um, I was always thinking of them and hoping for their health and well-being together. And so their illnesses were, were closely associated in my mind. And so when the first of them passed away, I think I was almost holding out on the other one. Um, I was like not letting myself start to grieve because I knew that the other, it was likely that they were to pass soon after. And now that they have both passed, I think once the second passed away, I think that it almost hit me harder in a sense. Um, cause it was like that event almost helped it helped me let go on both counts. There was this time between the two deaths that I think I wasn't quite processing the entire situation. I was preparing myself for the other to pass away. And when they finally did, then it was, it might've been that much more rough in a sense. Now it's difficult because one of them, the non-human one, was a pet. And I'm I'm finding all the different ways that I counted on them, that I knew that that I counted on them being there, and they're not anymore. And I think that's probably the hardest part. Um, like when I get up in the morning and go into the kitchen, they were usually 
laying by the entrance. Uh, whenever I lay things out on the floor, I'm always very careful not to keep them on the floor, just to prevent the, the pet from <laughs> getting a hold of those things. And when, I, when I've done those, <laughs> when I've kept things off the floor or thought twice about setting things down on the floor because of that reason, and then they're no longer here, it's just this ever constant reminder of their absence. And it's difficult. And I'm trying to look at this from the perspective of the stages of grief. I think at, at least <laughs> um, it kind of feels in a sense as if they're not quite gone. I'm still expecting them to be here, to have, in the case of the pet, you know, just time to spend with them. In the case of the person, the ability to just talk to them. And it's, it, I think that expectation is still there. It hasn't quite left. I haven't quite, I, I don't think I've <laughs> hit that acceptance part yet. Um, I do remember going through the bargaining stage. The, uh, hmm. okay, this stage, I'm not sure if it fits very cleanly into any of the five stages that we were talking about, but it was a lot of reflection and thinking about um, missed opportunity which I realize is, in my mind, it's, just, it's unhealthy to think that way, but I just, I can't help but address it. And there are like times where, um, like if only I'd talked to them more, if only I'd spent more evenings with them, if only, that sort of thing. But I think that the warning that I had, the, uh, the being alerted of their illnesses, and being able to prepare for that, both mentally and to make the most of the time that I had left, was a really fortunate thing in my mind. And I'm forever grateful that I, I did have the time that I had with both of them. Now, one thing I, I definitely need to keep in mind and to remember and to always uh, be wary of is the fact that they are gone and that no matter how much I feel like I should have done something, the fact that I know I can't anymore should be enough for me to let go of those feelings. Like in the, in the case of my dog, um, in, the, in the last few days, we had a feeling that they were going they were going to pass very soon. And I remember a couple days before it happened, I was able to watch a movie, and I got to hold her during that time. I was able to be there in the moment with her and appreciate her presence. And I'll, I'll always remember that. In the case of the human, <laughs> um, they were far away. And given the present circumstances, being in um, close physical contact was a bit difficult. But I know that they were always um, thinking of me and I of them. And, well, maybe not directly. We were connected. Um, and fortunately, before their illness and the pandemic and physical separation, I know that I was able to spend a, a, a period of time with them uh, just, just to be with them, uh, get to talk about things, get to go places together, and I'll always remember that trip. It was a, it was a special one that I, I really enjoyed. So it's been a little difficult, and so this episode was especially relevant to me. And I, I think going through the different stages from a scientific perspective that of denial, of anger, of bargaining, of depression, of acceptance has helped me better understand the stages of grief that I have gone through, am in the process of going through, and will go through in the future, in the near future, and in the distant future. It's time for the music update. This week, I'm looking forward to the release of the album from Spirit Box called Eternal Blue. And here are my music picks for this week. 
the first of which is East Chicago, Indiana by Michigander. English Indie. Cosmic Coming of Age by Fickle Friends, English Alternative. The Other Side by Wildlife, English Alternative. Ending Credits by Vacation Manor, English Indie Rock. Gems by Sofia Valdez, English Easy Alternative. Butterfly by Emily Weisband, featuring Karen Fairchild, English Alternative. Dial Tone by a Hotel Apache, English Alternative. Stinks for You, or a variation of that, by Sophie Cates, English Alt Pop. Motivation by Muna, English Alternative. Oceans Away by Sofia Valdez, English Easy Alternative. Anxious by Wildlife, English Alt Rock. Talking to Myself by Gatlin, English Indie. Time I Love to Waste by May A, English Alt Rock. Silhouette by Sofia Valdez, English Easy Alternative. Pistol Whip by Spill Tab, English Alternative. Worries by Kirara, Instrumental Electronic. Porcelain by Morgan, English Alternative. And there's my update for this week. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Spoon Drift. I know this one was especially difficult for me to record, and it might have been difficult for you to listen to, but hopefully you gained something from it. I know that I did. If you want to listen to the music that I talked about, you can check out my Spotify profile, The Spoon Drift Podcast, and find The Spoon Drift Season 2 Episode 30 playlist. For more episodes of The Spoon Drift, you can visit Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spinnaker Radio's home on the web, radio.unfspinnaker.com, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to keep up to date on everything to do with The Spoon Drift, you can follow me on Twitter, at Spoon Drift Pod, that's at Spoon Drift Pod, or on Instagram, at Spoon Drift Podcast, that's Spoon Drift Podcast. I hope to talk to you next week. I wish I was there to show you I care. Please know that I was, giving you lots of hugs. I was there, holding your hand. I was there, scratching your back, telling you I love you. There, through the discomfort, there with you. I was there, while miles away. I was there, with you as your grandson, as your brother, as your friend as your family. I was there sending you off, helping you get there safely, helping you climb the ladder into the stars. I want you to know I love you. Run free up in heaven. Tell everyone else I said hi. Keep each other company. To one of you, chase the lizards and let them go. Run on the beach like I know you never could. Run wild, run free. Be the puppy I know you can be. Do it knowing that I am there. To both of you, know that I am there. Running by your side, I am right there. With you at the kitchen table, I am right there. With you all the way. This isn't a goodbye. I will be right there. Remember, I will always. I will always see you later. I will always be right there.